House plants provide a variety of health-giving benefits and can be an ideal hobby for aging adults. If it's a flower, cactus, herb, or other greenery, indoor plants enable seniors to stay active while bringing splashes of nature and joy into their home. Indoor plants reduce stress by creating a comfortable, soothing, natural atmosphere. Today, you'll learn tips for getting your orchids to grow well with less effort, what to do after your orchid blooms, which orchids are easiest to grow, and how to find the right spot for your orchids needs. We are pleased to welcome Bradley Lau, the president of Honolulu Orchid Society since 2016. Bradley lives in the Mililani area and grows a wide variety of orchids and other tropical plants. Bradley Lau is an accredited orchid judge and enjoys helping others to learn more about orchids, orchid species and hybrids. Let's get started. Over to you, Bradley. Thank you very much, Val and Lonnie. Thank so you. I'm so glad to see so many of you joining us. And we went through the trouble of asking where people are from because that does affect how easy or not easy it is to grow orchids. And I see from our chat that we have, um, uh, we have viewers from Kauai, from Maui, from the Big Island, and Oahu. So that's great to hear about. Um, more on that later. So let's go ahead and get started. This is a uh, talk about seven tips to growing healthy orchids in Hawaii. All right, so on, oh, let me go back. Let's see here. Right, anyway, for the first slide, if you notice, there were two pictures. One was in the upper left-hand corner, that orange one, and that was a Asco Centrum. It's related to the Vanda family. And the one in the bottom right-hand corner was that white uh, flower that kind of looked like a starburst, and that was a Bobophyllum. So both of those are unusual species orchids that we'll hear more about. Uh, in this slide on the right, um, is a picture of Gramatophyllum. I mention it because look at what, how big the plant is. Um, it had 4,800 flowers, 148 buds on 41 flower spikes. And, and it took several people to bring into the orchid show area because it was so large. Uh, the owner in the top left-hand side, Roy Tokunaga, is a world-renowned orchid specialist and a member of our orchid society. He's a fantastic orchid resource. He's been active growing orchids. Uh, he's one of the co-owners of H&R Nursery uh, in Waimanalo. And he grew this giant, giant plant over a period of about 15 plus years um, and each year it divides and has a keiki and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Unfortunately, it's quite a handful to manage as you can see how large it is compared to him. Uh, but this is typical of orchids when grown to be of, uh, we call them specimen size. And so you could put this kind of plant in your landscape, for example, and it will grow quite nicely. All right, so what is it about orchids? Um, they're very, very popular to grow in Hawaii. They're relatively easy to find at farmer's markets or uh, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, and other sources. Uh, the climate here is actually quite good. It's not perfect, perfect, and we'll go more into that a little bit later, but in general, it's much easier to grow orchids uh, in Hawaii. Uh, there is a long history of orchid growing in Hawaii, so the interest has been long standing. And if you can just start simple with maybe a few of these tips to help you, you can be quite successful. Uh, here's just a couple of pictures. Uh, quite a few of these orchids I grew myself. Um, some of them are ones that uh, have 
been shared over our um, Honolulu Orchid Society uh, meetings. So in upper left-hand corner is an example of a Honohono dendrobium, extremely popular, fragrant, usually blooming around March or April. So coming up in this next month, uh, you may see more of these. I know they're pretty available at Kola Farmers, for example, uh, and they're, they only bloom once a year. So now's the time to be thinking of them. And then in the upper right-hand corner is an example of uh, Dendrobium Inobi Purple Splash, which is really, really popular. A white um, Phalaenopsis looking Dendrobium with a little purple striping marking on it. In the middle is a white Catalia, uh, very fragrant with beautiful coloration of the lip. In the bottom left-hand corner are examples of Phalaenopsis or the moth orchid. Those are very easy to find, very popular, long lasting, especially if you give it a cooler environment. And on the right-hand side is uh, examples of Vandas, um, uh, extremely colorful, uh, very, very easy to grow and manage, um, but can get a little bit on the big side, depending if you pick a plant that's more compact or one that's uh, kind of in the normal size Vanda. All right, so where to buy these? Uh, farmers markets all over will have vendors, uh, nurseries that do sell orchids at quite a reasonable price. Uh, the big box stores like Lowe's, Home Depot, and Walmart also have them. Some of those are being supplied by nurseries uh, in, in the various areas in Hawaii. Uh, you can go to garden stores like Kola Farmers. They usually have uh, a fair selection. Uh, you can go to orchid club meetings. You can go to orchid shows. Uh, there are orchid nurseries. Some are closed to the public, so you should call ahead of time. But a few are open. Um, and you can go online, either to uh, online nurseries in Hawaii, or you can go to the mainland. Uh, whenever you deal with the mainland orchid source, you might ask them if there are any restrictions to sending the plants to Hawaii, because we have strict rules from the Department of Agriculture as to the importation of orchids from outside Hawaii. Or you can talk to family and friends because a lot of times we grow so many orchids and have babies and divisions and so forth that we oftentimes will share with our family and friends. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner is an example of a very beautiful Cattleya. These are Cattleya hybrids, very fragrant, relatively long lasting, lasts about two weeks or more. In general, flowers will last longer when they're kept in cool, well-ventilated areas. So if it is hot, usually we try to bring them in or try to provide a, a climate that's good for them, um, but very, very beautiful. As you can see here, besides the flower in the picture, there can be other flowers on this same flower spike. So sometimes two or even three very large flowers. Uh, Hawaii's climate, um, the, the orchid growing requirements, light, air, water, and so forth, are all slightly different for the different orchids. Uh, Hawaii's climate in general provides the right ingredients to grow orchids, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, in Hawaii, we can grow almost all of our orchids outdoors, whereas on the mainland, sometimes the weather may change it may get too cold or for other reasons, a lot of times people will be growing orchids indoors or in the basement or in other places. And then it's a whole different set of problems there. Um, but you're very, um, you're very blessed to be able to have a climate that's so friendly to growing orchids. And so that's a great start to uh, enjoying them. Uh, why is Hawaii's climate not perfect? Well, sometimes we live in a place like the Eva Plains or Waianae in places that are not uh, as cool or maybe uh, a little drier, not as rainy. And so that's a little bit of a difficult problem to be able to overcome, but not impossible. 
Here's a picture on the bottom right of uh, Dendrobium hibiki, tiny bubbles. It has uh, very vibrant lavender purple type flowers that are relatively long lasting. Um, this one is growing in a four inch pot. So the, the plant is fairly compact, um, but it has beautiful long lasting flowers. They're not fragrant though. Uh, and they have a little bit of orange color in them. Okay, so orchids in Hawaii, they were grown from before 1940. We know this because our organization, Honolulu Orchid Society has been uh, active with members since like 1939. So we've been around a long time uh, and it, it remained active for many, many, many years and, and continues to be so. Uh, Hawaii was a pioneer in creating new orchid hybrids we had some of the world's very best well-known uh, orchid breeders and nurserymen and enthusiasts in Hawaii. Um, orchids are a strong part of the economy from that time and orchid nurseries uh, sprouted up all over the place. And even so now on the Big Island and on Maui, there are orchid nurseries that are doing quite well. Um, after the after World War II, there was a, a great interest in doing uh, orchids with home growing. And so there were a lot of people who uh, grew orchids and uh, actually pollinated their own and did their crosses and grew plants that were uh, unique and unusual. And one of the, or, one of the experienced orchid judges told me, one of the most interesting things about being an orchid judge was going to the various orchid shows each year and seeing new orchids that were created by members. Uh, we don't see that quite as much now. We rely on orchid nurseries to do all the work. Um, but in the past, it used to be so commonplace for people to come up with their own. And one of the fallouts from that is that they could name the orchid after family members or anything they wanted. So that was kind of a nice tribute um, to being able to come up with your own uh, orchid cross. Okay, so here, um, getting started on the upper right-hand corner is a great example of a Phalaenopsis with uh, branching inflorescence. This plant has one flower spike, but it's split in three different directions. So you can see it here. And in addition, each flower resembles each other flower. They're very uniform in coloration, which is unusual. And also they're all facing open, more or less in the same direction, which makes the, the flower presentation excellent. So a really good example of what uh, we're trying to achieve. Um, as far as getting started is concerned, uh, simple and basic can work. So when you're looking at the tips that we'll go over, just staying within um, the, the simple parts of it can, can be a good start for getting off to the right foot. Uh, you need to understand what orchids need, what are the requirements, and a little bit of understanding about some of the pitfalls and things that might stand in your way. And then the final thing I, I will mention here is that by understanding what your tendency is, for example, your tendency to water, do you like to water plants? Is that an enjoyable activity? Do you like to check on your plants every day or are you the opposite of that? Okay, so uh, just briefly, these are the parts of an orchid. Uh, this is a representative picture, but orchids can vary quite a bit. Some of them have these parts, but they're modified and look a little bit different. All orchids have three sepals. So you can see the three here, one on the very top in the middle and two on the sides on the bottom. Uh, sepals are the coverings of the bud that face on the outer side and they cover the petals. Um, so as the sepals open, they open first. They're followed by three petals. Uh, the petals you see here are on the right and the left in the middle. And then the lip 
on the bottom in the middle is a modified petal. Uh, the column is in the middle. It contains the reproductive organs that are needed for pollination. And then uh, uh, the seeds are extremely small. They're very, very tiny. And once they, the seed pod breaks, they float in the wind and disperse all over the place. Uh, tip one. So here's the first one. We want to start with a healthy plant, if at all possible. Now, healthy plant just means that the plant is free of disease, that it's vigorously growing, that it's ready to get bigger and not all wilted or wrinkled or broken leaves or broken canes and other things. So when you start with a healthier plant, whether it's smaller or bigger, that's always uh, a good thing if you have a choice. So as you're looking through the, the plants, when you're purchasing them, you're looking for ones that maybe have more shoots or have leaves that are more pristine. Those are all good things. Uh, orchids in general take many, many years to grow and have their first bloom. So if, you're, if it's an orchid growing from seed, it might take anywhere from three to seven years before that first bloom comes out. Um, Others that are cloned might take a little bit faster and some orchids actually are a little bit quicker and some take more time. So Cattleya, for example, will take up to that six or seven years, whereas Phalaenopsis might take only three years before you see the first bloom. With each year, more growth comes up and then the flowers get stronger, bigger, sometimes more, or the plant divides and you have more plant, which gives rise to more flowering. So a larger plant is stronger, it's more resistant to disease, it might bloom more. Uh, mature plants can actually have babies or cakeys that can be separated and create new plants, or it might have new shoots to it that would allow you to divide the plant in maybe two years or longer. Uh, the downside of a bigger, stronger, healthier plant is that it may cost quite a bit more. So it's usually more inexpensive to try and get a two or three inch pot plant, whereas one that's more four five or six inch pots might be uh, double or even triple the cost. Uh, in this picture on the bottom right, it's a picture of a nobile dendrobium. It's called Dendrobium Love Memory Fits. It was in one of our shows and was awarded uh, some years ago. And it's just, filled with fragrant dendrobium blooms. This is usually a spring bloomer. Okay, what makes a healthy plant? Strong leaves, thick canes or pseudobulbs, abundant roots. Orchids, one of the things, takeaway message is orchids really need strong roots. So when you see strong root growth, that's an indicator that the plant is doing really well. Sometimes too, you can see new shoots or cakey plants. So in the bottom left-hand corner, I show a picture here of a Phalaenopsis flower spike that led to growth of a baby plant, a cakey plant that has roots in this picture about three inches long and ready to be cut off from the flower spike and put into a little pot and grow into a new plant. Now, because this is vegetative growth, this plant is a identical copy of its parent. So uh, usually what happens is look on the tag, make sure you write a new tag with the same information on it, and you include that tag that identifies this plant in the new pot. That way you can keep track of which plant is which. On the right-hand side, we show an award-winning Dendrobium wine eye blush. So this plant several times was the best in show at our October Honolulu Orchid Society um, Orchid Show that we have. And it's just covered with these uh, cream to pink colored Dendrobium blossoms. And again, very long lasting. And this all started with just like one plant that had cakeys year after year after year and split off and just took off. So it's really, because those cakeys are uh, 
essentially propagations of the original plant, we consider this to be one plant. If you were to separate the plants from their mother plant, then each separation is considered a separate plant. But if you leave the baby plants attached to the mother plant, then we consider it all to be one plant. Okay, tip two, sunlight. So sunlight in Hawaii is very favorable. We have lots of sunlight. Unfortunately, it can be very strong. So just looking at sun in general, it's a little bit weaker, a little bit less intense in the early morning. So east facing morning sun is actually a little bit more favorable. Whereas by the time the afternoon comes around, it's quite, quite strong and very, very bright and you risk getting a little too much light along with a little too much heat. And so the plant leaves may be injured or sunburned by an excessive amount of light. A sunburning is much less common in the east facing morning light, but rises so that in the middle of the day you can get sunburn and certainly uh, in the afternoon you can get sunburn. So, um, the plants themselves need the right amount of light for the right amount of hours. More hours is better than less hours, sometimes even as much as six to eight hours of strong sunlight would be nice. So you can't really leave the plants too much in the shade. They will still grow, but they may not bloom as good because they're just not getting enough light energy to be able to generate what they need to grow. Uh, Leaf color should be a little bit lighter apple green type color. So in this picture of this Leparis species orchid, you can see that there are some leaves that look a little bit more yellowish, light green, and that's a good sign. In this particular picture, this um, plant has 410 flowers and 520 buds on these flower spikes. The plant is, is in a four inch or five inch uh, plastic basket. So it's really not that big a plant. We consider it more to be a compact growing or miniature type of plant. Uh, the flowers themselves are actually quite small. Uh, they only last for about a week or two. Uh, anyway, when giving sunlight, just be aware that full sun or no shade is a little too much for just about every orchid. And so having a little bit of uh, protection from full sun, such as um, being under the cover of plants or trees or under shade cloth are all good. I do grow some of my orchids under eave, which means I have them uh, under the roof eave facing the morning sunlight. And that tends to be okay for some of them that don't have as high uh, sun requirements. Otherwise I do have a small shade house where I have like a 50% shade cloth over them and that helps to cut some of the intensity of the light. Uh, leaf structure. When orchid, uh, when orchid leaves are broad and flat, such as the moth orchid or Phalaenopsis, that's an indicator that the plant collects a lot of light which means it's more prone to sun burning. So a wide flat leaf usually means the plant needs a little bit more shade, whereas an orchid that has thinner, narrow leaves collects less light and can tolerate a little bit more intense light. So just some general rules there. So you can actually look at a plant and you can tell from its leaf structure whether or not it might do a little bit better in the shade or a little bit better in more light. Okay, so understanding light. Too much shade can lead to leaves that are darker green in color. Too much light can lead to sunburning of the leaves. And most of that sunburn, just like for us getting sunburn, uh, can be from just overheating. So how fast can a, can a phalaenopsis like this bottom left-hand picture get too much light in let's say something like midday to afternoon sun? Well, I have burned some of my plant's leaves by leaving them out in uh, quite a bit of light 
even as little as five or six minutes. It doesn't take that long. The broader and flatter the leaf, the more it collects light, the quicker it can get sunburn. So with plants, got to be a little bit careful about where you put them and you can't lose track of them. So I like to leave my plants when I'm trying to move them around and whatnot, a little bit more in shadier areas so that if I lose track of something, I'm not leaving them out in the full light. Or you can, walk, you can work more in the earlier morning hours and that helps to reduce the amount of light that might unintentionally get on the plants. So very, very important to not let the plants overheat or get sunburned. Once they do get sunburned, that is permanent damage to the leaves. Okay. So here's an example of too much sunlight. It caused this uh, dead part of the leaf. Uh, it got overheated and then uh, it usually turns kind of a yellowish brown, followed by black, followed by dying off completely. So even though this leaf, this Phalaenopsis leaf is damaged, it is not completely damaged. And so it is okay to be able to let this stay on the plant. Uh, it's otherwise functioning as a leaf. It just has this little bit unsightly damage to it. Um, but as far as just growing the plant is concerned, it is okay to have this happen and you just carry on. Uh, tip three, watering. So in watering, plants, orchids need water, true, but they don't want to have too much water. So one of the problems with watering is that sometimes we water too much. That's kind of a big problem or watering too little. Uh, water quality does matter in that rainwater or water that has lower total dissolved salts is better for the plants than, uh, than just tap water. So depending on where you're living, uh, some people live in places where there's quite a bit of dissolved salts in their water. It is possible to test for that. The water quality reports you get from, uh, from our state do not include total dissolved salts. Uh, usually it's good to water your plant thoroughly and then let it dry out. When we say thoroughly, it might mean like 10 minutes worth of water on the plant. Um, think of your arm. So here you have your arm, it has skin on it. If I throw water on it, how much water gets soaked into your arm? Uh, not much because the water rolls right off your skin. Your skin is not absorbing very much at all. But if you go swimming and you're in the water, underwater, and your skin is, is exposed to moisture for a long period of time, your skin starts to absorb a little bit more moisture. And then over time, uh, it, it has a different amount of moisture that's in it. Same thing happens with orchids, especially the roots. So you can see in this top left-hand picture, the orchid plant is tied to a rock and the roots are a green color. As the plant dries out, the roots will turn more of a silvery white and then when you water the plant again, you will notice that the silvery white absorbs um, moisture and causes the plant roots to turn a green color. So that's a good indicator that the plant is absorbing moisture um, and that's good. Um, also a lot of water just rolls right off the plant, especially if it's hanging up like the dendrobium on the right. So giving it water, then more water and flushing out uh, anything like the salts that build up from fertilizer or other uh, causes might be a good thing to do. Um, knowing your water preference just means, do you, are you a person that waters more or waters less? Uh, in the middle picture is a picture of crown rot. That just means that with this Phalaenopsis or moth orchid, water was left in the crown of the plant and then sometimes bacteria or fungus can also be there and leads to rot damage, which actually stops new leaves from growing. Now, I don't always throw out these plants once this happens. 
I leave it alone. If the older mature leaves are big enough, then the plant will actually continue to grow. And if the root system is quite strong and the leaves are still salvageable here and there's not continuation of the rot, then um, sometimes a cakey plant can form and then that will lead to a new plant. But whenever you see water that collects in the crown like this, and which can happen with Vandas or Phalaenopsis, then just go ahead and tip the plant a little bit and get that water to drain out. Uh, and that will help to prevent the problem. Otherwise you can treat with a uh, fungicide or other type of treatment, and that sometimes will help. It kind of depends on how early you catch this problem. Okay, so upper right-hand corner is a picture of uh, Rhodromnia, which is an equitant oncidium, miniature uh, plant, uh, very dainty miniature flowers. This one has about 18 flowers on its flower spike, uh, but very colorful, uh, very cheerful, and very popular. Uh, they're not easy to find. Sometimes at orchid shows, you might, you might be able to find this. So the question is, do you like to water? If yes, then you can grow orchids in baskets with little or no bark or media. Um, baskets hang, they drain fast. So when you come back and water each day, the plant is ready for more water. If you're a person that's busy and don't have time for watering, you can put pots into um, media that holds water longer, such as sphagnum moss. When you go and buy orchids, sometimes you'll see this sphagnum moss in the pots. These uh, plants usually hold moisture longer, so it's really important not to water that too often. But it's also important when you're dealing with sphagnum moss to water it heavily, let it drain through completely. And when you're successful and you hold up the pot, you can tell that the pot is quite heavy. Um, the problem with sphagnum moss is that if you let it dry out way too much, it can get quite hard like an old dried out sponge. So when you pour water on top of it, the water runs right off and doesn't get absorbed. So imagine your dry sponge, you throw a little bit of water on it. How does it feel? Well, it didn't absorb very much moisture, so it remains light. But if you grab the same sponge and you dip it into a pot of water and you submerge it and you let it get fully expanded, now when you bring the sponge out of the water, it will feel heavy, like it's holding a lot of moisture. That's what you want the sphagnum moss to do. Hold a lot of moisture and then give it like a week, maybe four or five, seven days to let it dry out. And then before rewatering that, you can just pick up the pot and see how heavy it is. If it feels pretty heavy, it still has moisture in it. You don't want to keep giving more water to a pot with sphagnum moss in it that feels heavy because that will just promote rotting of the root system, which is not good for the plant. Remember, the roots need to be healthy for the plant to do well. Once the roots die, the plant usually shrivels up, the leaves get all wrinkled, and the plant does not do well. Uh, also, with more moisture in an orchid pot, the media, whether it's sphagnum moss or pine bark or anything, has a stronger tendency to age faster and rot which usually means that that media needs to be replaced. So more on that later uh, when we get to repotting. Okay, how do I know when to water next? Well, that's what we were just talking. Uh, if the pot is heavy, it's full of water, don't water it, just let it go. In general, it's safer to water less than too much. Unfortunately, a lot of us really like to water and so uh, we just have to be a little careful not to do that. So I myself, I like to water a lot. I just find it nice to be able to check on my plants and water. And so I, I have a strategy where I put my plants into baskets or other things where there's little or no media, which means if I water every day, then the plant will not rot or get too much moisture because the moisture doesn't really last much longer than about a day. 
The problem is, is if I go on a trip or someone else needs to water, then I rely on the strength of the plant to be able to weather not being exposed to water for let's say three or four days in between whenever I can get someone to come over to water my plants. Now, if the plant is healthy and has good leaves and good growth and area roots like the picture on the right, that's a trichoglottis vanda-like orchid, you can see it's growing quite vigorously, um, then it can go three, four days without water. It's not a big deal. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you can always feel the media, like you put your finger on the orchid bark or the sphagnum moss, and you can usually feel if it, you, it looks darker or it looks like it's got moisture in it, that's usually a good sign. Um, but you just have to know what's your watering tendency and uh, keep track of how often you're, you're watering your plants. Uh, water quality. You can actually purchase a meter which tests for total dissolved salts. If you're adding fertilizer to your water and the water already has a fairly high total dissolved salt count in it, it's still drinkable, it's still usable, but it's harder for the fertilizer to be absorbed into that. And it also increases the salts that are in the water. So when you water your plants, there is more salt buildup over time. So some of the ways around that is after you finish fertilizing at least once a week, you can water your plants very heavily to flush out remaining salts that might remain in the pot, in the media, and that helps uh, not allow that buildup. Fertilizer and salts that are on things like pine bark or sphagnum moss that build up over time increase the chance of the rotting process to occur in the pot. Um, so if you have a, one of these uh, little testing devices, you can order it online. Um, you can test your water and you can see how are you doing. Usually um, public water sources don't vary that much. If you're getting your water from a local well, um, the border water supply does not report the total dissolved salts in their report that they give you, but you can sometimes call and find out um, what is your total dissolved salt in your water supply for a given area. It's usually easier just to get the meter and test it yourself though. It doesn't usually vary uh, from different seasons or anything like that unless they change the water source. Uh, rainwater has extremely low total dissolved salt. So if you collect rainwater, that's an ideal water to use on your orchids. Uh, if you have your plants out in the rain, that's good too, as long as it's not like 40 days worth of rain that collects on your plants and causes them not to dry out. Um, and you can use reverse osmosis water. That's an ideal source of low total dissolved salts, uh, but it's more expensive to get a reverse osmosis filter and keep that up. And uh, the levels of total dissolved salt does vary quite a bit. So like in my area, my total dissolved salt might be 70 or 80, whereas maybe in Waimanalo or other places, it might be more like 300, 200 or 300. And so that makes it a lot more difficult to be adding um, fertilizer, especially in high amounts uh, to that water that has a little bit more of the salt already in it. Uh, tip four, air circulation. So orchids are above all air plants. They need air. Circulation and ventilation helps to keep the plants cooler, especially in this warm weather. Air delivers humidity or moisture. We don't often consider that, but if you look up any of the requirements for orchids, you see that they do better when there's like 60 to 80% humidity. In Hawaii, we oftentimes have more 80% humidity and sometimes more, 
We have trade winds that help to keep us cooler, so that's good, but we don't have to generally deal with uh, drier, less humid air, which is very common in the winter months and in certain places across the US. So uh, we take humidity for granted, um, realize that when it's lightly raining or maybe there has been sprinklers that have gone off below the plants, all of that moisture that's evaporating into the air is available for your orchids to pick up as well. So air delivers moisture, it does dry out the plant. If it's an extremely windy day, that can sometimes cause your plant to dry out a little bit more. The media will dry out faster. Um, and air, when it's circulating very well, helps to reduce diseases and rotting tendency. This picture on the right is a Podangus dactylocerus. It is a species orchid with a, a very small, it's a miniature orchid. It has small, thin, flat leaves and a lacy, very delicate, slightly fragrant um, white flower. Uh, many flowers on a flower inflorescence. This is only a um, about a three inch wood basket that it's growing in. But uh, as a plant gets bigger, it will have some cakeys and more and more plants will show up, which may allow the plant to have more and more blooms. Okay, so in general, you want to avoid crowding of plants where there's not good airflow in between plants. So this is a, just an example of putting many four inch pots next to each other in a tray. And this is a common way for us to put it on our plant bench, but it doesn't always leave enough space in between plants for everything to do well. So one of the techniques that we use is to put plants in every other opening, and that creates a little bit more space. If you have the space to be able to do this, that's a very good practice. Also, then you can see the plants a little bit better. They're not quite so crowded. So same thing with hanging plants. If you hang them, sometimes you can hang one above the other so that they're growing vertically rather than on one pole and you put them all side by side and you crowd them all in. It's a little bit more difficult for the plant to grow. Also, plants compete with light. So light from above will hit plants that have leaves that are higher and plants that are lower will get much less light. So you want to allow the plant to receive as much light as it can. You don't want to have your plants too close to a wall or corner because there can be um, less airflow in a place like a corner. You don't want to block your plants from getting good airflow uh, by having landscape plants, hedges or trees or anything that are blocking the airflow. So it's always good to look at your growing area and see how is the air flowing? Is it flowing really well? Uh, do you need to cut back or trim anything to allow uh, air to flow better? Uh, tip five, media. So here's a picture of, of various different media, which can be used in pots uh, that help orchids to grow. They all absorb moisture at different rates and allow more or less air gaps, which is important. They break down at different rates as well. So pine bark is in the left side picture, lower left, and it's a really common one. Uh, it lasts for about two years or so, a little bit shorter when the pot is smaller, uh, and a little bit shorter when you fertilize regularly or you water more often. It can dry out in about three days or so. Sphagnum moss is in the upper left-hand corner of that left picture. It's more expensive, it holds water better. So certain plants like small baby plants might do a little bit better uh, in sphagnum moss. Um, it does dry out more slowly, but don't let it completely dry out because then it, it's very hard to uh, get moisture back into it. 
You can use foam blocks, like when you get things that are shipped to you and there's these giant foam blocks, you can just break them up into one inch or two inch cubes and that can be used as media. Uh, it doesn't look that good, uh, but it doesn't break down and it's free because it came with your packing. Um, just don't use any foam pellets uh, or foam popcorn that dissolves in water. You can actually test it. You can get those foam popcorns and put them in water. And if it looks like they're melting, those aren't good to use. There are other ones that don't melt in water and those can be used. Sometimes we use them on the bottom of a pot to create air gaps. Uh, there's rubber mulch. I have that in that small picture in the middle. Uh, that's kind of from recycled tires. It's uh, something which can be added to the bark mix to help with um, not increasing moisture to be retained. Uh, it does cost a little bit more and eventually it does break down um, and it does have a little bit of chemical in that rubber material from the tires. Uh, clay balls, clay pebbles are on the far right and that's for hydroponic growing but it can also be used for orchids. Uh, it retains a little bit of the moisture, it has large air gaps in it, which is good. Unfortunately, it's very expensive. It can be reused. So if you just knock off all of the pebbles and clean them up, they can be put back into a pot and reused again. Uh, or you can use no media, which is my favorite, where you just have bare roots in an open basket uh, and I just tie the plant to the open basket, whether it's a wood or plastic basket. Um, but the problem is that it can dry out. So I favor using that method on plants that have stronger, thicker roots. Sometimes I'll do that with Vanda. Sometimes I'll do that with Cattleya. Uh, other plants don't really tolerate being dried out quite so much. So then I'll add other things like sphagnum moss or a little bit of pine bar, and that helps to hold moisture. Uh, pots. So here I have in the upper right hand corner some examples of some pots that I had at home. And on the bottom right, there's an example of a net basket. So it has lots of air gaps in it to allow uh, air to go in and for the media to dry out. So plastic comes in many sizes, shapes, it's really easy to find. It does dry out with the help of whatever holes. You can actually add holes, drill holes, or cut holes to allow for more moisture to escape. Clay pots in the upper left-hand side of that picture uh, do come in many sizes. Uh, a lot of times you can reuse clay pots. They do breed more, so they dry out more quickly. So let's say in a clay pot, I put sphagnum moss in it. Well, the sphagnum moss has more moisture in it, but if I want it to dry out a little bit more quickly, I can put the sphagnum moss in the clay pot. The clay pot will breathe a little bit more and allow more moisture to escape. If I put the same sphagnum moss in a plastic pot, the plastic won't breathe. And so more moisture will remain longer if I use that combination. Uh, cement pots, like the bottom left-hand corner picture uh, in the picture, are relatively easy to find. A lot of people used to make clay pots themselves, and so you'll find these uh, among older growers or those who have had a lot of chance to grow orchids in the past. They do breathe a little bit. They are heavy um, and good for plants that tend to be taller <laughs> or top-heavy that might blow over or tip over. So I use them a lot with uh, sometimes vandas, sometimes dendrobiums that, that grow tall. They do dry out or breathe a little bit. Um, and baskets. So, so in the bottom right-hand side, um, that airflow is a good thing. You can even put a net basket into another pot and that allows a little layer between the net basket and the pot to have uh, more airflow and a little bit more uh, drying out of the medium. Okay, number six, tip six, fertilizers. Fertilizers can be uh, fast absorbing or slow time release. Orchids will grow with or without fertilizer. They just grow a little slower 
without the fertilizer. So you're actually encouraging the plant to absorb the fertilizer and then have some results from the fertilizer. Uh, the choice of time release pellets or water soluble crystals is yours. You can use them in combination or one or the other. Um, so like one strategy is if you use time release pellets and you don't wanna bother with water soluble crystals is you can just in January, put the pellets on various plants not too many, like eight pellets on a four inch pot. And you can just leave it there for three to six months, uh, not usually longer than about six months. The fertilizer bag will have a little number on it that tells you how many months it would last. Um, and then around June, you do the same again a second time, and that's good for the rest of the year. Fertilizer in general have three numbers to it. These represent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. Um, and liquid fertilizer, once you mix it in water, that's the total dissolved salt thing we were talking about before, uh, do deliver the fertilizer immediately to the roots and or the canes or leaves. Uh, you can control the strength. The less the strength, the less the salt, um, and the less strong it is for the plant to absorb. So sometimes you can do a half string every two weeks. Sometimes you can use a full string once a month or even longer than that. Uh, but plants generally do a little bit better when you're not trying to do full string on the fertilizer. Okay. okay. Dad, we're nearing the time at, uh, we're at 9.52 right now. Okay, okay. okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit more quickly here. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are what's in the um, fertilizer. Ammonium-based fertilizers are the ones that are designed for orchids. So if you have regular Peters um, fertilizer crystals, that may not be uh, for orchids. So always read the labels and um, check to make sure that those are for orchid plants. Um, so here, nitrogen is for uh, growing shoots and leaves, phosphorus for root growth, and potassium for the hardiness of the plant. So here's just a picture of Nutricoat, which is a time-release fertilizer. It has 131111 as its strength. It lasts for like three to six months. Here's a liquid fertilizer, which is a crystal, and you dissolve it in water. You can control the strength. Notice the number is different, 13, 2, 13. And that helps to grow more leaves and more vigor for the plant itself. Okay, so here's potting and repotting. A um, Vanda-like plant in the left picture and the broken down media and basket that it was in. Here's a picture on the right where there's, le uh, where there's new roots poking out from a shoot. So that's a good thing to see. And those new roots will get longer and develop into a better plant. Uh, here's a picture of old roots, which have filled the pot and have nowhere to expand. So the plant was trying to grow new roots outside the pot. And then here's a picture on the upper right-hand corner of my sterilizing, um, device as well as uh, the tools that I use. On the bottom left-hand corner is a picture of a virus infected um, leaf. And the reason why you sterilize your tools with heat or alcohol is to prevent spreading of the virus from the plant uh, liquids from one plant to another as you cut them and take care of them. On the right is picture of uh, snail or slug damage, which can be treated with sodium ferric EDTA. So it's always good to check the leaves for that kind of damage. Um, here are some pictures of our orchid seed pod on the left and the little seeds in the middle and a picture of my vanilla bean seed pods, which are good for making vanilla extract and other things you can cook with that. Uh, reading a plant tag. So usually there are two names. 
you see on the middle and the upper, it says LC Irene Finney. LC is the genus name for Lelio catalia. And then this, the um, species name or hybrid name is Irene Finney. Um, genus, the first letter is always capitalized. So you can see cross or X with uh, Catalia walkeriana. So Catalia is the capitalized one. Uh, what if you lose a plant tag? Well, that's common. Uh, you can always ask the seller if you're buying an orchid or you can look on the ground to see where it went. Uh, you can rewrite the tag if it's kind of getting unreadable, but you try not to lose the tags because that identifies the plant. Um, so what orchids are easy? It depends where you live. If you live in Manoa Valley and it's cool and it's wet, you have an easier time than if you live in Waianae or the Upper Plain where it's hotter or drier. Some places in Maui, I saw people from Maui, uh, if you're up country or at elevation, it's a lot easier to grow, it's more favorable. You just have to be careful how much water uh, gets on the plants. Uh, what do you do after blooming? Well, for honohono dendrobiums, you can cut off the old cane, lay it flat on a uh, horizontal area, and new shoots will come up. Like this right picture, there's new cakey growths that are growing on this cane. And then once the roots are about an inch or two long, you can cut them off from the cane and put them into a small pot, three inch pot or so. And they'll grow into new plants. In this example of Phalaenopsis, after flowering, you see the brown flower spike, you can just cut them off. And then sometimes on the flower spike, if it remains green, you can cut it off and at the growing um, points, you can see either a new plant growing, which is in the top right hand corner, or a new flower spike emerging. So you don't always have to cut off the old flower spike. Uh, only if it turns all brown and it dies. Okay, do orchids bloom more than once a year? Some do, but many only bloom once a year. Some have long lasting blooms. Um, so in this example here, dendrobium royal chip on the bottom right, that's a Luturia dendrobium. It has long lasting uh, flowers by nature um, that may last two months, which is really nice. Uh, and what is the right location? Well, if you find a place that has some sun, not too shady, you can create a shade house, like on the right. This one is using Easy Corner Pipes, uh, which is a company in Ikea area, um, where they sell the poles and the shade cloth and whatnot, and you can create your own at home. Uh, and it's a bit of trial and error. So you have to try some plants, see if it grows, see if it blooms. Notice which ones might grow well for you. Check out your neighbors and see what's growing well for them. Talk to them. Uh, maybe go to your local orchid club meeting or show and ask questions. Here are some orchid resources. Uh, you can read about orchid care online at Honolulu Orchid Society or American Orchid Society. So Orchids Magazine in the top right comes from American Orchid Society. And in the bottom right is an example of our website for Honolulu Orchid Society. Here's an orchid resource PDF that I created. And um, at the very end, I will clip and paste this uh, link to our chat and you can help yourself to it. You can just copy it. If you click on it, it will be a one page summary of some orchid resource uh, links. Or you can go to HonoluOrchidSociety.org and go to Orchid Resources and it will show the same thing. Okay, so what's the bottom line? Hawaii is a great place to grow orchids. You can enjoy growing them and other tropical plants. When you see nice orchids, ask the owners, how did they do that? And see what works in your area. Your area is unique based on where you live. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, the Honolulu Orchid Society meets monthly on the second Wednesday at 7 p.m. Lana Kila Elementary School Cafeteria. Coming up on March 8th at 6.30 is our annual silent auction where we bring in plants 
from Maui and the Big Island and Oahu, and people bid on it, 